All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you are eight years and younger and you uh, are wanting to come up to the front, please come on up to the front. Uh, we are going to do a brief family devotion. If you are eight years or younger, please come on up to the front. We're going to do a family devotion again uh, as your children make their way up. That is you consenting for them to be on our uh, website, our YouTube channel. If you do not want them on social media or on our website, please keep them back with you. You may be famous. Who knows? Yeah. This is everybody. Okay. Cool. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Yeah. Anybody new here? Who's new here? You're new. You're new. Okay. You're new. I don't think you're new. Are you new? Sort of, maybe. Yeah, that's good. That's cool. He's new. Hey, buddy. Alex. That's a good name. I like your shirt. Cool. Okay, I'm going to tell you guys a really cool story, okay? Who has friends? Everybody has friends, right? If not, my, my kids will be your friends. Okay. You have 158 friends. You have quite a following. That's awesome. Um, okay, so who has a place to live? Everybody have a place to live up here? Okay. Everybody have a home? Sweet. So let's say you had two friends who both had different families. So they come from different families. Okay? Let's name them Abby and Sam. Okay? Let's say Abby and Sam come over to play. And you have a new LOL surprise, or maybe you have like a cool Wonder Woman, or like a Batman toy that you just can't wait to play with them, or something like maybe if you guys play video games, but let me play video games. And they come over to play with you guys, and all of a sudden, they start breaking the rules in your house. And your mommy and daddy have told you, do not let anybody climb on the couch, lick the TV. You know, that's weird, but your friends are doing that, you know? And all of a sudden, you're like, I'm going to confront these two friends, Abby and Sam. I'm going to say, hey, that is not how you behave in our home. And let's say, oh, they say, like, I'm so sorry. Okay, I won't do that. I won't lick your TV anymore, and I won't walk on your couch. And you're like, okay, but i got to tell my mommy who's going to tell your parents. So let's say your mommy tells their parents, okay? Now let's say Sam goes home, and he gets in big trouble. He gets in such big trouble that his parents read him all of the rules of their house. But they're screaming at him. And they're yelling. And they're throwing papers that they, like, they wrote rules in their house. And this is how you have to behave when you go to somebody else's house. And let's say that's Sam. That's like your friend Sam. And he gets so sad and he's crying and he's upset. But man, it doesn't end there because then his parents tell him every single day how he failed to keep the rules. But let's say you have another friend. Remember, Abby, that's your second friend. Let's say he goes home after she hangs out at your house and she broke your rules and your mom tells her mom. And when she goes home, she's met with strict but kind and gentle grace. Maybe something like this. Hey, that's not how you're supposed to do that. You know better. You know mommy and dad love you. You're representing us. That's not how you behave in that house. Right? And let's say all of a sudden Abby's like, oh my goodness. I feel bad that I did that because I upset my mommy and daddy who I love. Because why? I know they love me so much. Right? And let's say Abby's like, man... My parents, I want to be like because they treated me so kind and so gentle and so loving. I want to act like they act. Here's my question. Who had the better family? Who, who, had, who had nicer parents? Abby? Okay. Not Sam? No. Okay. Abby. Why would you say Abby? Why do you think Abby? Because they were being nicer. Okay. They were being gentle maybe. But why else? Why? Yeah. Carson. Cool name. Um, then you'd be nice. They, they would give you a wife. 
yeah, maybe he, maybe Abby got a lollipop because those those parents were nice to them. I bet Abby's going to go back to your house next time and she's going to behave because of how gentleness and sternness was modeled to her because she was so loved. Unlike Sam, who was kind of abused a little bit with all of the law and all of the regulations of their house. Can I share it with you guys? Do you know that Jesus came to earth to fulfill the law, the perfect law, so that when you don't behave right, he's not coming at you like craziness. He's coming at you with gentleness and lowliness and love, but with sternness, because he wants you to be like him, because that's God's best for you. Right? Right. So who's the best model in the world? God or Jesus? That's awesome. How, who do you want to behave like when you go home today? Um, yeah. Behave like Jesus, right? Because he's the perfect model of how to be. My mom? You want to be like your mom? Yeah. She's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> awesome. okay, so when we go home today, guys, let's be more like Jesus because he's the perfect model. Of Y'all go back to your parents and stuff. Thanks for coming up here. Fourth and below, fourth grade and below, y'all can be, uh, you can go back to your classroom today uh, in your children's wing. You guys are dismissed. Fifth and up, you guys need to stay in service. Uh, we will do communion after the sermon. So fourth grade and below, you're dismissed to your classes. Fifth and up, y'all need to stay put. Well, good morning. If you're new to Calvary Chapel Fayetteville, can you just raise a hand for me? If this is your first time visiting, raise a hand. Awesome. Welcome to CC Fay. It's so good to have you guys. Uh, welcome to yeah Calvary Chapel Fayetteville. If you're in the foyer, I would invite you to come in. I see you. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to Calvary Chapel Fayetteville. It's good to have you all. We're going to give the parents a few more moments to drop their kids off. <laughs> If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we can get you one. If you want to raise your hand, we will bring you a Bible. We will be continuing our study in the book of 1 Timothy. We're actually ending chapter 3 today, which is really exciting because chapter 4 is, is going is to take another turn in Paul's letter to his protege, Timothy. Let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We know that it is living and active. Father, we know that you have exalted over your creation, your name and your word. And so this morning, Lord, we come with humble hearts, wanting to learn from you. What is this mystery of godliness? How can we be more godlike? Lord, we want to learn what does it mean to be in the church? Lord, I pray that you would speak this morning. For those who don't know you, for those who have never heard the gospel, for those who have never really had a personal relationship with you, for those who have never experienced the freedom that you offer when sins are forgiven, when sins are completely canceled, there's no more record of debt, there is no more guilt. Lord, I pray that you would speak to those hearts this morning. Lord, for the weary, I pray that you would give them strength. Lord, for those who need conviction, I pray you would give it. Lord, I ask that you would speak this morning. Hide me from my own opinion, and may you speak forth your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, last week in chapter 3, we looked at uh, the qualifications of deacons, or those who serve in the church. 
Remember, we are all of us called to serve in the church. Uh, We don't have to have a title to do that, but we get to do that. Jesus himself said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and give my life as a ransom. As As we serve, we see God work through us. Remember, we looked at Acts chapter 6, and when those deacons, when those seven individuals, those seven men were chosen to serve, we saw the expansive kingdom. We saw uh, Jerusalem literally uh, become almost lit on fire by heaven as disciples were made, and the word of God continued to spread. It's interesting to note that when we serve, we can literally behold that happening. When you get involved in your local church and you pick up a trowel or you pick up a computer or you do something here to serve, God is going to honor that and bless that and kingdom is going to expand. That's always how it's really worked. But this morning we're going to look at a particular text that really exhorts us to godliness. Furthermore, this text really uplifts and exalts the local church. Um, It tells us, what the church is and what it's not. The church is not just a building where you go to Sunday, go on Sunday and you hear a guy talk about some things and you get some warm feelings in your heart and then you leave and you continue your your existence in that week. But literally the church is a household. It's a family. It's something that we belong in and that we're committed to. Paul is going to unpack that for us this morning. But first Paul has some salutations or some, some, some heart feelings for his beloved protege. He says in verse 14, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that. Remember, Paul really desired to come back to Ephesus. He wanted to go back and check on how things were going on in Ephesus with the Ephesian elders and everybody that he really strengthened and saw grow in the Lord. Uh, But we know in Acts chapter 20 uh, that Paul would never return to Ephesus. In fact, when he left, he left with so much tears because he knew that that was the last time he was going to see them. Acts 20 verse 38, he says, basically, I'm leaving knowing that I'm not going to return to you. But my heart is absolutely for you because I love you and I would want to see this church continue to be built up. One thing that we have to note in the Christian walk is that we need to have an absolute love for the church. Not a church in the sense of the building and the structure and, 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 and that, although that's okay. But really a love for the people in the church. A love for one another. A love that when you leave, you're literally leaving a brother or a sister. You're leaving family. You're not just leaving people who you happen to give a high five and say, hey, it's great to see you again. How was your week? That's not the church. The church is a body of believers knit together by Christ's own love and blood. And so Paul took the church extremely seriously. And we're going to find out what exactly the extent of that extreme looks like this morning. He says, I'm writing these things. What are these things? Well, we looked at already in chapter one and chapter two and even chapter three. We looked at how Paul was exhorting the the, the Ephesians not to give way to false doctrine. Not not to believe in a a false gospel. And a false gospel would say, hey, it's not just grace, it's grace plus works. A false gospel is something like, hey, it's not enough that you just got saved. You need to add to your salvation. It's not enough that you just believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. You actually need to do some sort of work. You have to go do some things. You have to memorize genealogies and things like this. And Paul annotated that in chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, Paul was exhorting the men and the women and how to act with one another in the congregation. There was some behavior gone wild in Ephesus. And Paul was correcting that. And in chapter 3, as we just went through these past, I don't know, three or four weeks, Paul is exhorting the leadership in the church how leaders are supposed to be, and how those leaders are qualified to be in the church. And so Paul is saying, I'm writing these things for a very, very specific, specific, specific reason. Very, very specific. It's interesting to note that we are not alone in 2020. Meaning, you're not here at church this morning, and you're just getting to hear this guy talk about some antiquated rules and exhortations and do better, live better, have your best life now, go read a great book on self-help. 
Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and others, have given us instructions on how to be Christian. Furthermore, we just don't have the Word of God, the Bible. We also have the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 6, Jesus himself said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you, bring remembrance to you uh, all the things that Jesus has said. So you have the Word of God, the Bible, and then you have the Holy Spirit. Isn't that incredible? So when you're reading the Bible, or when you're sitting under the teaching of the Bible, it's not just you're hearing all of these different things, but that the Holy Spirit is literally working in your heart to give you understanding on what the Holy Spirit would have you say, or excuse me, have you learned about what the Scripture is saying to you specifically. It's interesting, um, one brother went to a conference in actually North Carolina who's written commentaries <laughs> upon commentaries, and he's a Bible scholar guy. And one pastor came to him and said, hey, um, do, you, do you see this here in this particular passage? And he showed him the passage. He showed him the chapter. He showed him the verse. And this scholar pastor guy said, oh my goodness, I have never seen that before. That's incredible. Out of all of the commentary he's written, out of the, all of the time he's been preaching out of that text, he's never seen that come out of that particular text before. That is so incredible because that is how the Holy Spirit will use his word to impact individuals where they're at, what they're doing. Furthermore, as you're reading the Bible for yourself, it's interesting when you come back to the Bible, maybe for a second or third time in that same chapter, you're going to read something that maybe you thought you read before, but man, it's just, it's just saying something different to you today. How incredible is the Holy Spirit as he's using his word? We also have the fellowship of the saints. 1 John 1, verse 7, it says, John says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So as Paul's writing this and concluding this third chapter, he's writing these things to the church, to Paul, to the various churches in Ephesus, so they would remember how to be in the household of God. The same is true with us this morning. We have the word of God that is a light unto our path and is a guide unto our steps so that we know how to be and how to do and how to act and how to in, be involved with one another. We were not left alone. In fact, we have kind of little to figure out. If you're here at this church and you're thinking, how in the world could I meet somebody new this morning? Or how could I actually engage uh, in love with another brother or another sister this morning. Well, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, is going to lead you and show you how to do that. You don't really have to figure out how to simply be a Christian. We're not alone in 2020. Furthermore, Paul is writing this, really this whole letter, but not just this letter, all of the letters he wrote, for the express purpose of verse 15. Verse 15, if you will, is really the thesis of the whole entire pastoral epistles, or the P.E. Verse 15 gives us the reason why Paul would even write what he wrote to Timothy, why he would even write what he wrote to Ephesus. Verse 15. He's writing these things, verse 14, so that, verse 15, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar of and buttress of truth. So Paul is writing this epistle so that Ephesus and those Ephesian Christians, those fledgling Ephesian Christians, remember they were just recently saved. They're figuring out how to do church. Here we go. Paul's writing them letters on how to actually be in congregation, to be a Christian in this new birth of the ecclesia, the birth of the church. But remember back in Acts chapter 20, Paul was so emotional over leaving Ephesus. Why? Because he knew there were going to be wolves coming into the church. He knew that there were going to be individuals coming in to literally take people away from true doctrine, from Paul's teaching and the apostles' teaching. He was emotionally distraught because in his leaving, as the pastor of that fledgling church, he knew that there were going to be these eels that were going to come in and disrupt the fellowship. Well, now that's happened. Now Ephesus is really destroyed by these wolves. The wolves have ascended, or excuse me, descended onto Ephesus. And so that's why Paul sends Timothy, and that's why he's writing this epistle. 
to correct heresy, to correct behavior, to make right, to, to put into order the church of Jesus Christ. You know, I don't you know if you have children here this morning. Um, but if my children ever go to your house and we have a play date with your family, if my children don't behave a certain way, I will really, really want to know it. Like, let me know as their dad how they didn't behave. Because I'm hoping to train my children on how to act when mom and dad aren't there. Teaching them, graciously showing them, giving them an example on how to do those things. But if they come over to your house and they're just running amok, man, please let me know about that. Hopefully they won't. Because they know better. Because they've been taught. They've been, they've been disciplined. They've been shown. This is how you behave. Well, that's exactly what Paul is doing with the pastoral epistles. He's telling Ephesus, this is how you act and this is how you behave in the local congregation. This is really what right looks like in the church. But here's the thing, though. The Greek word for behavior here isn't what you would think is behavior. It's just the best English word that we have that basically summarizes what Paul is meaning. The Greek word literally means to turn back. So it could actually be read, verse 15, I am writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how to turn back in the household of God. Why is that so important? Because I think some of us may think, oh, wow, so Paul's going to tell us a certain list on how to act and how to be, uh, some rules and some regulations and some things I need to know in my mind and I have to do so I can be a certain way. I certainly can't be drinking. I certainly can't be smoking. I certainly can't be listening to Kanye West's new King Jesus CD. There are things that I can't do now because I am in the household of God. Great. More rules more regulations, more things to do and to not do. Thank you, Paul the Apostle. I appreciate you not leaving us as orphans in this whole 2020 year to figure out how to do church. If that's your understanding of Christianity, you have a very, very wrong view of Christianity. In fact, what Paul is saying is not that you would become your best Enneagram. He's not saying that you would become your best personality type so that you would dispatch the best qualities of your person in behavioral modification, he's literally saying, I am exhorting you and I'm writing these things so that you would turn back to the perfect model of person, which is Jesus Christ. So there is no list, there is no rule, book, following, there's none of this stuff. It's simply to turn back to be Christ in the household of God. Romans 8, 28. Excuse me, 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Ephesians 4.15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Jesus or to him. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So your whole Christian experience isn't being moral. It isn't about doing better. It isn't about behaving better than you did last year. Or if I go to that party, I'm not going to do that because if I do that, man, that's going to happen. It's not about rules and regulations. It's about going after Jesus and being more like Jesus in the world he's called you to be. Which, by the way, will certainly mean you begin to die to yourself and you magnify Christ. Which may or may not mean you do certain things or other things. Therefore, the goal is Jesus Christ. He will modify your behavior. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. As you're be, being filled of the Holy Spirit, He's going to show you what things you don't need to do and what things you need to be doing. He's going to lead you what to take away and what to put on. He's going to show you this is how you be more like me, and if you continue to do that, you're going to be less and less like me. By the way, if you're married, there is no greater way in which Christ will show you that except through mar I mean, in marriage. It's an amazing thing how the crucible of marriage, the glory of marriage, literally refines you into a holier individual as you're being really transformed more and more like Christ, as that other of you, that oneness of you, is really showing you how to be more like Him. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, 
how to conduct themselves like Christ, how to behave like Christ. Furthermore, Paul always emphasized this idea of imitation. Remember in Romans and Corinthians and Philippians, Paul will always say this idea of following me as I'm following Christ. Paul is never saying, hey, follow me, and here are all of these rules, here are all of these regulations, this is how you're going to behave better. He's saying, as you follow my example, as you follow my teaching, you're actually following Jesus. Which means you'll be conformed into who Jesus is. Not a bunch of rules and how to be a better Christian. The goal is Christ and his likeness, not rule keeping and law. Furthermore, this behavior modification, this transformation into Christ's likeness is so that you can be a certain way in the household of God. Literally, the Greek word is oikos, and it's it's just that. It's a house. It's not a building. But real quick, just on the note of the building thing, I I, I always hear this criticism. It's not about the building, man. It's not about the building. I, I totally get that. The first century church were in houses, And when those churches began to grow, they would go into more central city places. And and as the church began to grow, the Lord would provide buildings and we have what we have today. There's nothing necessarily wrong with the building. Okay, Leave the building alone, people. The building's okay. But certainly it is not about the building. It's about being a family of God. The building is okay. Literally, then, if if we're talking about the house of God, if we're talking about how to be like Christ in the house of God, this definitely has a familial context. The church, then, is a family of individuals who are being being built up to be more like Christ. We're not a family that's looking around of who's being more holy. Let me, you know, bring out this list, whatever that means. Let me bring this list out, and let me just go inspect fruit. Making sure that you and you and you are are looking and being a certain way because if you don't look and you don't be a certain way, you really don't belong here. That is not the definition of church. Mark Dever, who's pretty much the scholar on the local church, says this. The local church is not just a collection of your personal friendships. It's It's much more like your immediate and extended family only where Christmas gatherings happen every single week. I don't know what your Christmas gathering was like this year, um, but that's what, that's what the church is. You get to gather with one another in community as family, and all of us then are growing to be more like Jesus in this family called the church. So here's my question for you. How do you view the local church? What is your view on the ecclesia, on the church, on the called out ones? Is it a social club that you get to dress your best to? And people say, ooh, cool sweater, where'd you get that? Is it a check-the-block gathering where you get to come and you, okay, cool, I did that, I'm cool, great, here's my little offering thing, here you go, I'm out. Is it a religious exercise because mom and dad did such a great job growing up that you just know you have to go to church? Or is it a committed community of broken vessels growing in grace together? That's the church. Brokenness being made more, not just whole and your best Enneagram, but being literally built up and made to be and to literally exalt Jesus. By the way, if you're a Christian and you belong here at Calvary Chapel Fayetteville, this is your home church, that whole thing, that community, family living, being built up, Jesus stuff, is absolutely going to be impossible if you don't have genuine love for one another. Absolutely impossible. There is no way you're going to be a part of this family of broken vessels if you don't genuinely love one another. In fact, John, in his letter, 1 John, his epistle, says this in chapter 2, verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is actually still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Meaning, if you are in the church, and you are of the light that is Jesus, and you love one another, praise God, you are literally warding off darkness in this very congregation. Furthermore, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 22, verse uh, 36, we all know this verse so, so well. Remember, a Pharisee or a teacher of the law came to Jesus saying, Hey, 
What is the greatest commandment? What is the greatest commandment? I want to know because if you know it, I want to do it because I want to be the, great, the greatest and the best Pharisee. Jesus says in verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Verse 38, this is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. You can't live in this Christian community without love. A love that literally fulfills all of the law and all of the prophets. A love that you really get to understand when you really, really understand the love of the Father. Can I just say something? If you have a problem loving one another as Christians, even in this church, you probably have a misunderstanding or a misappropriation or maybe you don't even understand God's love specifically for you. But when you really understand the love of God for yourself and what that means for your life, it's almost impossible not to share that same love with other individuals. Not to have grace for them and mercy for them and kindness for them and peace for them because you were shown that from Christ himself. And then Paul says this household of God, this ecclesia, literally is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of truth. Actually, in the Greek, it should read living God's church. There, it's in Arthurus. There is no uh, proper, excuse me, there's no... Uh, Definitive, like the there. Um, it's just the living God's or living God's church. In Acts chapter 20, Paul makes this very, very profound statement about the church. He's leaving the Ephesians. He's saying goodbye to the elders. He's moved with tears and all of this emotion. And he says in verse 28 that the church of the living God was bought by Christ's own blood. So what we get to do as Christians, what we get to have in this church is literally something that has been afforded to us because Jesus' blood was shed upon that. I do not understand how one can have a low view of the local church. Blows my mind. If you believe that Jesus Christ died for this very entity, the local church, to have a congregation of believers where we literally are knit together in love and we can afford love to one another because we ourselves have been loved. I do not understand how your view of the local church is so low. Because Christ's view of the church was so high, so high that he's literally saying, I have shed my own blood to literally have this thing be in existence, even in 2020. This thing that literally has priests being built up. This thing that literally is being knit together in love and then endowed with gifts so that the edification of this church can literally continue to grow and grow and grow into Christ's likeness. I do not understand how one can have a low view of the church when the Savior who loves you so much bled and died for her. Again, Mark Dever has an interesting quote about the local church. In concluding his book on the church, he says this. Many Protestants have begun to think that because the church is not essential to the gospel, it is not important to the gospel. This is an unbiblical, false, and dangerous conclusion. Our churches are the proof of the gospel. In the gatherings of the church, the Christian scriptures are read. In the ordinances of the church, the work of Christ is depicted. In the life of the local church, the character of God himself should be evident. So when the world looks at our church, are they seeing literally a depiction of God or just more worldliness? A church seriously compromised in character would seem to make the gospel itself irrelevant. The doctrine of the church is important because it is tied to the good news or the gospel itself. The church is to be the appearance of the gospel. It is what the gospel looks like when played out in people's lives. The way the church and you take away the visible manifestation of the gospel in the world. Literally, when you leave this local congregation, when you leave this body, you go into your particular workplaces or homes, you are literally displaying the gospel as a part of the local church. 
Christians, not just as individuals, but as God's people are bound together in churches, are the clearest picture the world sees of who God is and what his will is for them. We are the clearest picture of what the world will ever see of God as a local church gathered in a local, local city. Absolutely incredible. Paul said in Ephesians, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authority in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose. The question I have is, what is your view of the local church? Is it a household of God? Is it the church of the living God or the living God's church? Or is it just some sort of little thing you do because you just scheduled into your week? How do you view the local church? That understanding, that perspective, that theology will literally change the trajectory of your life in Christ. If you're all in and you're committed to the local church, I guarantee you, you're going to be growing into Christ-likeness. If your view of the local church is this, well, I go on Sundays and I do this little thing and I'm out. You will probably be the same individual today a year from now. Can I just say a fear of mine? Actually, probably one of the greatest fears of mine is that me as, as Kyle, as a Christian, that I would be the same man a year from now that I am today. Woe to me if that's the trajectory of my life. Woe to me if I didn't grow to be more like Jesus over 365 days. Let me just say this though. I am not going to grow into more like, more like Christ, like Christ likeness if I'm not committed to my local church. I'm going to isolate myself. I'm going to, I'm going to check the spiritual block because I'm reading my Bible and that's really cool and I get really good feelings as I read my Bible with myself. But as I'm committed and involved in being built in the local church, I know brothers and sisters are going to cause me to grow and grow and grow into Christ himself. And then finally, Paul says that this church is literally a buttress and a pillar of truth. Literally, the church of Jesus Christ, we, the gathered church, platform truth. We are like the pillars in an, a massing, like a, just a big cathedral. And the top of that cathedral is all of the truth. We, the church, uplift that. We, the church, show that. We, the church, platform that. Imagine us walking out of here this morning. We go into our communities and we go into our fellowships or wherever we're going to do, whatever we're going to do this week. We're going into our training little things or we're going back to our families. Imagine if this church walked out of here declaring the truth, making disciples and loving our neighbor. Imagine if we walked out of here this Sunday morning and we literally committed this week, not just to one another, but to the commission we all have as Christians. We would literally be platforming the truth of heaven in this world. We would be literally displaying Jesus to this world. And we do that. We do that. And I'm grateful for it. And then Paul closes this chapter in verse 16. He says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Some of you are thinking, I... Okay, that's my fear too. Uh, I don't want to be the same man that I am today. I have one too many things going on that are, I know right now are literally snares in my life that are keeping me from growing in grace. I don't want to be the same guy I am today a year from now. I want to continue to grow and grow and grow into Christ's likeness. I want to be godly. I want to be a woman of God. I want to be a man of God. Well, the key here then is not that you would follow some sort of rules, but that you, like the early church, would confess this mystery. What is this mystery? What is this mystery of godliness? What is the key to grow and grow and grow into Christ's likeness? It's not rules and moralism. It's literally the incarnation of Christ himself. The key to godliness and growth into godliness is recognizing who Jesus is right now in your life. How to be like God. 
It's not lists. It's not rules. It's not places. It's not people. It's not promotion. It's not duty. God-likeness and behavior of God is literally rooted in Jesus. The mystery that Paul is speaking about in closing this chapter is literally Jesus. That final verse is the summation of his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. How do you grow in godliness? How do you become not the same man that you are today a year from now? How do you lay aside sin and those things that so easily entangle you and completely fumble your walk in faith, your walk as a Christian? How do you shoulder a cross more? How do you love one another more? How do you grow to be like Jesus more? Is literally to exalt Jesus in your life. Not rules, not regulations, but literally saying, Jesus, I want you more in my life than ever before. Put away all of the religion, put away all of the to-dos, and literally come to Christ and say, Jesus, I want more of you in my life. I want to be more like you. I want to give like you. I want to love like you. I want to know the word like you. Pray, Christ, help me to be godly, because you were literally the culmination. You were the consummation. You were the summation of all things holy and godly, but fully man and fully God. The key to godliness then is Christ. The key to Christ is the gospel. The key to the gospel is by faith alone. Do you, do you desire to live a godly life? I hate to say this so simplistically. Then literally repent and believe in the gospel. Confess with your mouth. Believe with your heart. And the Bible says you will be saved. If you've never known Jesus before, if you're entrenched in some sort of pattern of behavior that's destructive and destroying your family and destroying your life, cry out to Jesus. The Bible says that there is no other name whereby men can be saved except under the name of Christ the King. If you don't know Him, He will literally transform your life and He won't leave you alone. I think some Christians get so bogged down with, with going to church and doing, 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 they miss the gospel even as they've been saved for years after years, after years. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much that the mystery of godliness isn't performing. It's not a what, but it's a who. Lord, it was you coming to this earth. It was you living the life that you lived. It was you receiving all of the scourge that you did. It was you being raised from the dead. That's the key to godly living. You, Jesus. So Lord, help us to get more of you in our life. Jesus, help us to get more of your word in our life. That's instruction. That's, that's a guide to us in this Christian walk. Lord, I pray for those who don't know you this morning, that they wouldn't leave here thinking, I have to go do things. But Lord, that they would recognize that they just have to come to you broken and humbled by your love for them. Lord, for us who are committed to this local church, for us who are gathered here, for us who are Calvary Chapel faithful, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to build this church, use this church, soak this church in your love. Love for one another, love for our neighbor, and love, most importantly, for